Hi, everybody. It's Donna from Yoga in My School, and this is the Yoga in My School podcast, a podcast that empowers parents and teachers to share the joys of yoga and mindfulness with youth. And um, we've been going through a a major shift in our podcast in the last little while. Um, Technology and updates and all this kind of stuff has required a, uh, like, yeah, let's just call it a major shift. (laughs) I'm 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 on a learning curve, people. (laughs) It's going to be awesome. (laughs) But um, due to that, we are now available on more distribution networks. So you can always, as always, you can find us on Apple Podcasts. You can find us now on Spotify, yes, as well as iHeartRadio, which is really cool. So definitely follow, share, do all those kind of things and let others know about uh, the Yoga My School podcast and our amazing guests and all that we've been doing over the many, many years that we've been doing this. Um, and we've now gone, we're going to be going, if you're listening to this in the audio, we also have video of this. So you can go find the video on YouTube. And if you're watching the video, well, there are tons and tons of archives in the audio. So, you know, share and share alike, go and find your favorite format and enjoy, you know, enriching yourself with all things youth yoga and mindfulness related. All right. That being said, it is a pleasure, an absolute delight to reconnect with my very good friend, Jennifer Cohen Harper, this morning. Um, yeah, it is quite early in the morning here for me. It's about 7.30 and it's pitch black outside. <laughs> so you're welcome because I'm way north. If people aren't aware of where I'm located, I'm up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and we're into the longest nights of the year, people. <laughs> So, um, you know, the sun gets up about 8.30 and it sets about 4 kind of thing. Um, so at least we do see sun. You know, that that's a good thing. So you really need your practice. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. But we're going to be chatting this morning, uh, today, with Jennifer Cohen Harper. And she is the founder of Little Flower Yoga and um, an amazing, an amazing person. I am t- so thankful to be able to call her my friend and colleague. And she has just written, along with the artist Karen Gilmore, Uh, a beautiful new book called Thank You Body, Thank You Heart. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about the book and about her work and all that kind of loveliness. So welcome, Jennifer. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you for having me, Donna. It's good to see you again. Um, It is cold here, but not dark. (laughs) So so I'm, uh, I'm doing well this morning, and I'm really happy to talk with you. Awesome. So for people who aren't familiar with your work, um, can you tell them a little bit about what you do and how you do it and how amazing you are? <laughs> um, sure. So I, um, I started, as you mentioned, Little Flower Yoga in 2006 um, after working with children my whole life since I was a child. Um, And at the point when I started Little Flower, I'd been sharing mindfulness and yoga with children in a variety of spaces, in domestic violence shelters, um, in schools, and really it was all I wanted to do. I had gotten a master's in education at that point and was kind of looking down the, the length of a career path, working for the Department of Education here in New York and, um, I just knew what I wanted to do was something different. So since then, I've been um, offering programming in schools, um, working directly with students, but also extensively working with staff, both educators and mental health care providers in schools. And we've got a thriving program here in New York with about 30 teachers or so now, and we work with hundreds of schools and run a teacher training certification program and you know that's the primary work is sharing these practices in ways that um, support student well-being bolster resilience um, help kids find a sense of self-awareness and personal power so that when they come up against their greatest challenges um, they know how to use their inner resources and that's that's my primary work and part of that work has been creating books and resources, Mm -hmm. both for schools, but also for families. And and we do a lot of uh, family engagement programming as well through Little Flower in coordination with the schools. So we're always looking to develop resources for families. And and that's included books, card decks, um, activity and coloring books. Um, Mm -hmm. But also, you know, now I have a seven-year-old and a two-year-old. And so, of course, 
you know, when your own kids are, are born and growing up and you work with kids, things evolve and change because um, you see different needs and you learn different lessons. So for me, you know, one of the challenges of doing this work and having kids of my own is thinking about how I bring it to them in a way that lets me just be mom and not feel, you know, teachy or preachy at home. Um, and one of the things that my kids love is books, is stories. So, you know, I've really been thinking for, for many years now about what are the sort of distilled essences of the practices that I think are most impactful, that are most important to incorporate for kids on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and just, you know, kind of rolling around how to deliver those in ways that feel good as a family. And to me, picture books are really the best way to get something kind of embedded, <laughs> downloaded into our kids because, um, you know, I don't know about everybody else's kids. Um, I only, you know, I know the ones I know and the ones I know like to read the same books over and over and over and over again. <laughs> right? So for me, it's like such a natural thing. If you can create a story that kids connect to, if you can put it in a book that they like, um, then they get the repetition naturally because they want it. Um, and, you know, bedtime is a really wonderful time for ritual and um, anything that you want to do on a daily basis, if you can do it right when you wake up or right before you go to bed, um, it really helps maintain um, the habit. So creating a bedtime book just kind of was all the threads coming together and I really kind of created it for my, for my girls. Um, <laughs> and, you know, then it became, of course, something more, and I'm really excited about it, and the feedback has just been incredible, and, and people seem to have really connected to it, so I'm, I'm very grateful. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'm going to just show people, because people may not be familiar with your amazing card decks. Yeah. Look at these. So um, yoga and mindfulness practice. Well, these are the ones that you did with Karen. Uh, you also have the chair yoga one. You have others, but these are the ones that you did with Karen and Karen illustrated them. And then you collaborated again this time with the, the board book with Karen. And she's an amazing artist. I love, I love her depictions. But tell us a little bit about um, how it's different from creating a card deck to doing a book together. Yeah, so um, Karen and I have worked together a lot. Karen was actually part of one of the earliest Little Flower Yoga training cohorts. Um, back, I think in 2007 or 2008, she graduated from Little Flower training. So we've known each other a long time now. Um, and working with her is so wonderful because she really understands the intention, All right? So I, I've done other projects in the past with artists who weren't, um, really in that children's yoga and mindfulness world and it's it's different you know they, they can do great work but it feels very different um karen really understands the intention so we've done a lot of projects together now um and what was interesting is in the card decks um every practice is individual and there's like 50 some odd practices in mm -hmm. each card deck um and we really wanted to um show a huge variety of kids of body types of of human experiences in the card deck and then in, it's coming into a story and it's it's really it's really the book is one practice right mm -hmm. it's, it's a gratitude yeah. body scan so in the card decks we have tons of practices it's meant to be a resource um, that you kind of mix and match and play with and kids can use and, and adults teachers can use the book we were really thinking about um, the home and the experiences kids have with their families. Not to say that um, teachers couldn't use the book in class, because they do when they have, um, but we were really thinking about creating um, scenes more than showing individual kids doing stuff, mm -hmm. right? So we wanted to show um, experiences. And for those who haven't seen the book, um, it's a gratitude-based body scan, and it explores each part of the body thinking about um, appreciating and thanking the body for what it's done that day. So we wanted to create in the art scenes of everyday life um, and really like day-to-day -day things, because the intention is to foster a sense of gratitude for the little day-to-day -day, um, common things in life, um, which are always there, right? Which are always there. So, you know, fostering a sense of gratitude, you don't have to wait until there's something special. You know, we're really trying to encourage kids to just um, 
you know, absorb the idea that there's much to be grateful for in day-to-day -day life in the ordinary little things. So the illustrations are really that, you know, just um, scenes of everyday life and, and how we use our body as we move through the world. Very cool. All right, so I've tried to do this and not very successfully. <laughs> you obviously were successful um, because I've read some, you read the book and it, it's lovely, but how difficult was it to do the rhyming and the rhythm? <laughs> Because it's one thing to do a body scan, like, okay, so, you know, you explained that, you know, to do a body scan, and I do body scans all the time in my classes, yes. and in, in my, you know, my life, um, and, but you made it rhyme. Yeah, I, I really, like, put myself in a box with that one, because I, I decided early on, okay, I like reading books to my kids that rhyme. Right, so I was trying to think about, like, what's gonna make a kid wanna read this every night? What's gonna make a parent steer them toward, well, why don't we do this? You know, what's gonna make a parent enjoy this? If you're writing a book that's intended to be read over and over again, you really gotta like make it engaging, right? Mm -hmm. And for me as a parent, I prefer reading books that rhyme, if I'm gonna have to read the same yeah. book over, and over a bazillion times, which I do. So I decided that, and then I also was thinking, how are kids gonna remember this? Because you know, eventually they're not gonna read the book anymore, and they're not gonna read it every night, no matter what I hope for. So I wanted it to be easy to remember, right? And rhymes are easier to remember. So I decided I'm gonna make it rhyme. I put it in my you know, information for the publisher. I sent in my sample pages, you know, like my two pages, all in rhyme. And then I'm like, oh. <laughs> this is awesome. and I, I you know then I realized I got to make this whole entire thing rhyme now I've locked myself into an entire series that rhymes because of, we're doing more so now I'm like oh boy Jen what have you done but the thing is it, it actually also made it way more fun mm. um and I think I had two things going for me one is I, I grew up in a family where we just like sing all the time I mean not with particularly good voices some of them better than others I'm on the side but my dad really loved like musical theater um, and we grew up like watching musicals like movies all the time and just we're in this family where like we're always singing stuff both like actual songs but just like singing about what we're doing or somebody says something and then like everybody starts singing like it reminds you of a song and so I think like this sort of sing-songy, rhyming kind of thing is actually kind of part of our family culture in a way, like that's, it's really common. Um, and I have a now seven-year-old daughter who was super into creating this with me. And, and so we were for a long time, and we were doing this even before I was physically writing the book down because we were experimenting with nighttime rituals. So this kind of, you know, thank you feet that worked all day, you helped me stand, you helped me play, like those sorts of things we were playing with just as a family at bedtime before I started writing the book. So we were able to draw on those and then it was really fun for me and my, my oldest to brainstorm this stuff. Mm -hmm. And she, it, it was just, it became a, a connecting activity for us to do, um, which made it a lot more enjoyable. That's fun. That's really cool. Like I said, I've tried. Can't do it. <laughs> it's really hard. So kudos to you. It's not easy. It's not, and you know, I had to throw away a lot of things that I liked. You know, mm -hmm. that's the hardest thing, you know, and they say that like when you're writing and I, I've had the experience from writing other books, not children's books, um, that sometimes in the editing process, you just have to toss something you really like. And I try to like carve it out and save it for future use. But because of the, the structure, I really did need to change some things and, and let go of some things that I liked. But I think it was totally worth it because now um, kids remember it. I mean, both of my kids, even my youngest, she's only two and a half. And she knows like large parts of it by heart because she'll just be sitting in the room like looking at it and she can't read and she's, she's saying it. And mm -hmm. my oldest, entire thing verbatim and I feel like if they remember it in that way it's it's constantly the message is constantly sort of um sinking in it's becoming part of their inner voice which is important 
really important, right? And that's kind of one of the main goals of what we do. It's like give them practices that they can then rely on when the need arises. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, so this body scan before bed. Mm -hmm idea all right so explain a little bit for listeners and we've been talking about body scan there may be some people who are listening who have no idea what a body scan is so can you kind of explain that concept and then we'll get into the gratitude aspect of that and how you melded those together yeah absolutely so a body scan is a practice that is spans many many traditions right mindfulness and yoga but it's also a fairly common practice in a lot of um different contemplative traditions. And it's really very simple. The intention is just to bring a little bit of awareness to each part of your body, slowly and methodically. So in, in our house, um, we usually start with the feet um, and move up through the body. And you can do it as, as detailed or as general as you want. So if you wanted to, as an adult, do a really long body scan, you can start with your pinky toe, right? And go toe by toe by toe. Um, but it's a wonderful practice for attuning to the sensations in your body, reconnecting with and noticing what's happening in your body. Um, and it's also just a very practical, simple way to slow and steady your mind. Um, and, and, you know, with kids, we try to make it very explicit because it's, you know, to say like, bring your awareness to your foot. They're like, what? <laughs> to be more specific you know notice what your foot is feeling right now or imagine your foot getting heavy or imagine your foot getting warm or think about everything your foot did for you today right so like just you know you can use a really wide variety of prompts um, to just give a little attention to different parts of the body and then you move through the body and in doing so I find you remember that you're an embodied being, mm. right? It's very easy, especially in our culture. We really are um, intellectualizing our lives constantly, right? We're a very heady culture. Um, and our kids grow up in that and we grow up in that. And there are real consequences to um, this embodiment, primarily that we lose often the ability to interpret the sensations of our body and use our body to gather useful information about the world, right? And, and oftentimes sensation in our body, because we've been disconnected from it, because we don't understand it, because we don't value it, um, we feel it and it causes anxiety, right? So, you know, this body scan is really a, a practice of remembering that you have a body, right? And, and actively um, giving time to the relationship between your body and mind and honing it and, and giving yourself the message that the experience of your physical body is important and worth paying attention to. And, you know, I could, I could go on and on and on about this, but, you know, that's at, at its core um, why I think a body scan practice is so important as a regular habitual practice. You know, because we live in a culture that takes us out of our body, that values the mind over the body, unless you can monetize it, right? Unless you're like a professional sports player or something. And then it's really about what your body can do, not what it feels, right? Mm -hmm. so even that, in that it's disembodying, right? Even yeah. if you make a career out of using your body, you're actually supposed to override all of the sensations of your body in order to produce right so yeah we live in a disembodying culture <laughs> <laughs> love it love it thank you very much all right so then you took this body scan practice which is a, like you say a really standard practice it's it's part of many you know a lot of people use it during shavasana your final relaxation people use it as a relaxation technique before bed um just all kinds of purposes and uses for this this mindfulness technique and then you combined it. You did this like gen magic and put it with a gratitude practice, which is kind of a different spin on a body scan, right? So tell me a little bit about why, why that connection? Why did you do those two things? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Yeah. And, and this is something that we've been doing in our programming for a really long time, right? So it wasn't like um, specific to this book. It's really specific to teaching these practices to kids in ways that work for them, right? So, you know, the thing about bringing this gratitude to the body scan is that in addition to sort of being a disembodied culture, we're also living in a culture where kids learn, unfortunately, really early in their life that the world cares a lot about the way they look. And, you know, I have two little girls and really almost from birth, I mean, maybe from birth, the world relates to them based on how they look. I mean, I can't stop, you know, people from talking about how cute they are and, you know, and of course, and they are cute and I, and it's nice when people say they're cute, but you know, they're listening, right? They're listening and they have absorbed and all of our kids have absorbed this messaging that people are paying a lot of attention to how you look. And I noticed with my oldest daughter, especially when she started kindergarten, she started paying a lot more attention to how she looked. You know, and I, I could see her like looking in the mirror in a different way and caring more about what she was wearing and just becoming a little more aware and not, not in an extreme way, but I did notice it and I wanted to catch it. You know, I wanted to address it immediately uh, before it became something more. And to me, when you think about how much emphasis the world places on what our bodies look like, you know, the natural antidote to that is paying attention to what our bodies do and feel mm -hmm. like. And so I don't want to set her up for shame and say, like, it doesn't matter what you look like. And, you know, the, the reality is that's not the world we live in, right? And I also don't want her to feel, and I don't want any of our kids to feel um, bad about themselves because they want to look nice, right? Like, that's insane natural part of living in a society right is like you want to pick out your clothes you want to create the way you are perceived in the world so I was really grappling with this like how do you not create shame around caring what you look like, about what you mm -hmm. look like while at the same time not letting it be the whole story right so that's why I continuously in the body scan practice but in all of the yoga practices you know, when I teach and, and when we teach in our program, we put a ton of emphasis on what do you feel? What do you mm -hmm. notice? And, you know, I, I think most good programs do that, you know, and, and it's becoming, thankfully, a much more common part of our field, right? To say it's not just, you know, doing yoga. It's not just creating a shape with your body. It's noticing the sensations that are created where the magic really happens. Yeah. Right, so this idea of recognizing what our body is doing for us is actually something that's embedded through all of our practices. You know, I'm, the kids are in, you know, warrior, and I'm asking, what part of your body feels like it's working hard right now? Is there any part of your body that can relax right now, even though you're really working hard? And this sort of identification with what the body feels like, what it's experiencing, and what it is doing, right? How it's helping us experience the world. To me, if the more we can bring that into our kids' day-to-day -day life, the more there'll be a balance in how they see themselves, right? So yeah. the way they look isn't the whole story. Yeah, I love that. I love, you know, just really, and creating that that gratitude, you know, it's, it's uh, the, you know, be appreciative of the functions that your body performs for you every day that you almost take for granted. Um, because you just do stuff until you're injured or until like, something happens and you're like, oh, darn it, I can't do my regular stuff anymore. And that's when you really start to appreciate your body. It's like all of a sudden when it starts, you know, not working well for you. So it's like, let's appreciate it when it does work well for you and, and cultivate that, you know, that sense of gratitude for all that we have and all that we've been given. Love it. All right. Now, um, the other aspect of this book is that you've um, you're, you've and you've talked about it a couple of times already. Is the fact of routines and establishing routines for kids. Um, so, as a parent and as an educator, why are routines so important? Um, oh, so many reasons. <laughs> but I'll give you the highlights, right? So, routines are really. Um, essential and I say that as somebody who as a 
the parent has very flexible routines, you know, because it, it's both, right? Mm -hmm. But um, routines give kids a sense of predictability. And if you think about the experience of being a child, um, especially a really young child, like where people actually like pick you up all day, you know, you don't have a lot of predictability. You don't have a lot of the capacity to make your own decisions about your day, which takes away a lot of your capacity to like mentally prepare for what's coming. You know, and if you think about as adults, like how much mentally preparing we do <laughs> for our lives and, you know, some people more than others, but you know, we do a lot of mental preparation for our day. You know, we, we pick out our clothes based on what we're doing that day. We gather up the supplies we need. You know, we think about kind of what kind of mindset we need to be in. And for some people, like if something changes in that plan, they really struggle with, mm -hmm. with changing gears, right? And a lot of our kids do too, but we don't always give them the opportunity to mentally prepare when plans change. Um, or even when plans don't, they don't always know the plan, right? So when we can create routines, they give kids a sense of safety, a sense of the capacity to mentally prepare, um, a sense that like there's rhyme and reason in the universe, right? Like they, they can understand their day. Mm -hmm. um, routines are really soothing to kids in that way. Um, they also are great for establishing um, habits or traits that we want to cultivate, right? So we know that um, the, you know, the, there's so many expressions for it, but you know, the like neurons that fire together, wire together thing, you know, when we use our brain and our body in a particular way over and over again, it gets easier and easier for it to work in that particular way. And that includes physical tasks. It also includes mental tasks like gratitude or self-compassion, right? The more we express and feel gratitude, the easier it is to find it everywhere and feel it on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we create routines that incorporate those sorts of things, we naturally build up those capacities in our kids. Now, I will say it is extremely important to have flexible routines and help kids understand when and in what situations the routine might change. Because it's also, as a parent, it's so easy to trap yourself in a routine. And then all of a sudden, like, my kid needs this routine to go to bed. Well, what happens if you're stuck in traffic and they have to fall asleep in the car or you're staying at a family member's house or whatever, they have to go to sleep with a babysitter. You know, you, you have to, um, you have to remember that in the routine, we want kids to understand like these are the things that will be consistent. And then if these things change, I'm going to let you know, right? And if the routine is changing, you want to tell kids, hey, things are going to be a little different tonight. Let's talk about it now. Do you have any questions? So you're not just, you know, springing it on them and they have no chance to mentally shift. Yeah, so important. Thank you so much. Those are great tips. So one other thing for the parents who are listening, um, a lot of parents struggle with helping their kids settle down and go to bed. <laughs> right? It's like we've all been there. It's like, just go to sleep already. Right? <laughs> what are some tips that you might be able to give parents? Like what, what can they do to help? So we've got, you know, what, what might, you know, some <laughs> assists be on the routine. Yeah. Bedtime is really tricky, right? Because bedtime is, um, you know, I, I think before you become a parent, like you sort of, at least for me, like you see all these beautiful pictures and like all these things about like bedtime and how sweet it is and like loving and you're, I'm going to read my kids stories and tell them lullabies and lullabies and like bedtime sort of romanticized. And then I think, you know, you become a parent and like, it, it's very easy for it to feel like a nonstop power struggle. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when you're exhausted, your kids are exhausted, everybody's just, it's just intense, right? And for parents, it's really easy to feel, and I've definitely felt this, like almost just desperate for the kids to go to, like just mm -hmm. go to sleep right now. And, <laughs> and it's so natural to feel that. And at the same time, I think one of the big challenges of bedtime is that for kids, if we think about it from their perspective, you know, bedtime is a natural period of separation. Mm. Bedtime is inevitably, even if your kid's sleeping right next to you, right? Like bedtime is a period of separation and a period of vulnerability. 
So even if they don't know it intellectually, the human body and nervous system understand that in sleep, I'm vulnerable. Mm -hmm. right? And what keeps kids safe is their grownups. Right? What keep from a, a deep instinctual nervous system level, kids know that I'm only as safe as I am cared for. Mm -hmm. right? and, and connection with a competent caregiver is the primary way that kids help themselves feel safe. Right? So if you think about bedtime as a period of disconnection, as a period of vulnerability, right? when human beings are sleeping, we're very vulnerable and they know that then it's really natural that anxiety goes up at bedtime, right? For the kid, right? Mm -hmm. so as the parents are feeling this desperation to get them to sleep, the kid is like, wait, but I need to be with you. I need to be with you because I'm feeling anxious because my body knows sleep is a time of vulnerability. That makes me want you more, <laughs> right? So our, we're trying to disconnect as our kids are trying to connect. And the combination, I think, is, is really tricky. And often, I think kids do get the sensation, the, the sort of felt sensation of, like, my parents are trying to get rid of me, mm -hmm. right? Imagine how, like, you would feel that um, when we have that energy of just go to sleep right now. Mm -hmm. So all of that being said, you know, the things that have worked best for me, you know, and I, I have two kids. And one of the things that I actually am really proud of as a parent, and believe me, there's the things that I'm not, but the things that I'm really proud of, one of them is my kids will really, they sleep. They sleep anywhere. <laughs> and, you know, we worked hard on this and, and they will sleep anywhere in any situation. They can sleep with a babysitter. They can sleep at a music festival. They can sleep at my parents' house. Like, they sleep. And, the thing that helped the most in getting them to that place where they felt good about going to sleep is shifting for us, really shifting the idea of bedtime from the goal being to get them to sleep to the goal being to connect mm -hmm. and the goal being to kind of fill up their love well, their connection well, their safety well, so much that they felt comfortable and safe enough to fall asleep on their own. And, you know, it's not about, um, it, it's not that, it's not that anything I'm doing is making them go to sleep. It's mm -hmm. that sleep is a natural bodily need, right? So if you look at it as like what's getting in the way of sleep, then you can try to work backwards and help with those, meeting those needs. You know, kids don't need us to go to sleep because their bodies need to sleep. If their bodies aren't falling asleep, it's either because something's getting in the way, often some sort of fear or anxiety, or they're not tired yet. That's a whole other conversation. Like trying to get kids in bed when they're not tired, right? We'll save that one for another day. But if we are paying attention to their bodies, right, and, and putting them to bed at a time that's naturally appropriate for them, then if they can't sleep, it's because something's getting in the way. It may be that they don't feel connected enough to relax into sleep mm. right their nervous system needs to know hey my person still has me right i'm not going to be alone when i go to sleep so you got to do that connection piece like as much as you can or oftentimes i find with a lot of kids they have fears around bedtime that are being minimized by the grown-ups mm. um, fears about all sorts of things like my when my daughter was little well, she's still little, but when she was littler, um, she was really, really very concerned that the house was going to catch on fire while she was sleeping. And, and I think a lot of kids have that fear, mm -hmm. but whether it's a fire, whether it's monsters, whatever it is, there's a lot of vulnerability that happens at, during sleep and kids get scared. Kids get scared. And as adults, we often try to minimize that in order to alleviate it. But as you know very well, um, there's no, you, you can't ignore a feeling to make it go away, right? And when we try to minimize something, what we're really saying to the kids is, I'm not gonna help you with this, right? Like if we don't acknowledge that the problem exists, how can we be part of the solution, right? So for our kids at night, um, one thing that has really helped me is thinking about what's getting in the way of them being able to naturally easily fall asleep. Like, do I need to like love them up? and do some things that really make us feel connected? Um, or are there real anxieties and fears here that we need to address? Um, and 
you know, for my daughter, as an example, saying like, oh, that's never going to happen. The house isn't going to burn down, blah, blah, blah. That's all minimizing. That's all like dismissive and mm -hmm. they know it, right? They know it. And if we don't help our kids with the things that they're afraid of, we're just leaving them to deal with it alone, right? So for me, it was like total opposite approach. Like, okay, what, a, what is concerning you? Let's figure it out together. Like she was going around the house checking the fire alarm batteries. We had to make like a whole little plan, a little map. Mm -hmm. Like if there is a fire, like we know it's unlikely, but if there is, let's be prepared. Okay, where are you gonna go? What are you gonna do? If this, then that. And, and she had to like go through the whole thing, right? Yeah. She, we practiced it. You know, we had to practice it. And when we acknowledged that her fear was real, um, and gave her strategies and like real honest solutions. It was, she was okay. She went to sleep. Awesome. That is so cool. I am thrilled. We're kind of wrapping up now. It has been a delight chatting with you this morning. <laughs> the, it's starting just barely to get light outside for me. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you. But I will wake up anytime, anytime to chat with you about these wonderful topics. Um, you're so amazing. Thank you for, for sharing with us today. And I know the listeners are extremely grateful for, and the watchers at this point. Yay, watchers. <laughs> um, where can people find out more information about your work? Um, sure. So if you, the, the easiest way is just to go to littleflowerioga.com um, and we have all the normal social media channels too, you know, um, Facebook, Instagram, all of that. Um, if you're interested more in the book um, and thinking about um, mindful parenting, I have also my own um, kind of author Instagram, which is just Jennifer Cohen Harper um, and Facebook as well, where I share a lot. Um, about the mindful parenting experience. Um, Little Flower will have a lot more information for parents, but also for educators and um, people in professional work with children. Uh, Fabulous. Thank you so much. I so appreciate your time and your expertise and sharing so generously. I look forward to uh, hearing more about Thank You Body, Thank You Heart, and all that, the impact that it's making in other people's lives. Thank you so much to all of everybody who's watching, who's listening, who's part of the Yoga in My School community. I encourage you, if something today has tweaked your interest, follow up and definitely share it with someone. I know when I listen to podcasts, I often think of people that I would like to share the content with and they come to mind. So please do that. And, and let's, you know, let's share the yoga love, people. <laughs> let's do it. Thank all you right. so much, Donna. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.